So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for uh, joining me here on a Friday morning Minnesota time. And if you're on the East Coast, well, good afternoon. Um, we're going to get started, and we're going to make this somewhat interactive, as I've indicated before the session started. Um, you'll see the people that's logged in here. It's not necessarily essential. You have to log in. It just makes it a little more interactive. And I'm going to ask a few questions just to get to know you guys a little bit better as well. You can use the QR code or you can use this link. And this link will stay up throughout the whole presentation. So if you don't do it initially, you can always do it at any time during the session. Let's go ahead. And we are, I'm actually timing this. My goal is to keep this to 30 minutes. So plus or minus a few minutes. So let's get started. Uh, this presentation is going to be uh, tricks and best practices on using games to teach. And this is a little bit of a challenge because we got 30 minutes and this means many different things to different people. And to a certain degree, I'm kind of assuming I'm probably, you know, preaching to the choir that you're here because you, you either use games in the classroom or you're looking to use games in the classroom. So and people come in with different ex experience levels. So I'll try to do the best I can. Hopefully I can give you at least one good tip during this session that you can walk away with. And after all, it's only 30 minutes, so I'm not going to give you 20 different tips, but I'll try to give you a few tips and some ideas to think about. I happen to be using Tally. And one of the things I like about Tally and also a lot of the games now is I can minimize whoever's in the participant list and really give myself more real estate. I also created all the images you see in here in PowerPoint. So I just wanted to point out how I kind of made this. I'm a very visual presenter uh, and I'm just gonna mute a few people here. All right, so we're gonna be talking about some tips here and I'm also gonna talk a little bit about my journey of using games. And let's go ahead and introduce me. My name is John Dillon, and this is something I don't really tell people a lot, and I may have had interacted with some of you in, that are in this webinar today uh, doing tech support, but I'm actually the founder of C3 Softworks, and my background is quite buried. Um, I've been a paramedic for, well, I've been in EMS for 43 years, 41 years of those as a paramedic, but really the key thing is I've been an educator almost my whole adult life. Back in the 70s, I'm actually going to mute my content up here. Back in the 70s, I started teaching, teaching CPR, and that evolved uh, into the 80s into teach CPR, first aid, advanced cardiac life support, pediatric advanced life support, and other types of training to emergency medical technician, paramedic, blah, 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 blah. But one thing I've always, you know, tried to embrace as an educator is always trying to find unique ways to make my training engaging. Now, it happens to be the tagline. I'm also the voice of the uh, tutorials on C3 Softworks, and it's a tagline I said at the end, and it's very natural for me to say that. It wasn't something we sat in the boardroom, hey, let's come up with a tagline. It's just something I've always believed in. And it's not just games. I always try to find unique ways to deliver my content, to make my training engaging. Games just happen to be one of those tools I use in my tool bag or my teaching tool bag, um, and I use it, you know, when needed. So, and I also do a lot of the product development. So we, we rely on feedback from customers and users out there and we make modifications. And we've made many modifications since the iteration of the first C3 game that we made back in the early 2000s. So I'm gonna get some information for you here. And this is, I'm, I'll talk about these questions a little bit and the purpose of them. Are you currently using the Bravo Zone? And if you don't know what it is, you can just say no. The purpose of this question is twofold. One, it tells me, you know, if you're a user, so I may reference this. If I have a lot of users of the software, I'll make some other references. If you're not a user of the software, that's okay. Well, at least you understand why I may stop and talk about something that may not apply to somebody that says no. And I'm going to move along through these. By the way, I can hover over this anytime and see who has not answered. Oh, Tiffany, but I'm not going to get too hung up if somebody doesn't ring in here, just for time's sake. I'm going to go ahead and show. So 58% of you have never used it. And that's fine. And that's totally, totally cool. But I will add some uh, tips and tricks for those that are using the software uh, throughout. But I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. Also, one trick I can do is I can just advance by just hitting my right arrow key on my keyboard. 
Here's another question. And this is a question I asked when I was doing um, a lot of conference uh, presentations and using games to teach. And I really wanted to kind of find out where my audience saw, get, saw games. So go ahead and pick the best answer. Now you can pick multiple answers here, but really just pick an answer that really reflects how you see games. And while people are answering here real quick, I want to show you too, this is very important for a live event. If you need to remove somebody, now here we don't have anything online, there's no teams, but I can always remove somebody by just simply clicking on their name and double clicking and it gives me the option to remove them. That's really important if you have teams because if somebody leaves or has technical issues, that counts against them. All right, we got a 100% answer. All right, so like I said, I was speaking to the choir. When I was doing conferences, sometimes I'd have people in the session that really did not see games as a teaching tool. They saw them really as, as more fun than educational. And I love having those people in the groups because when I do my talk, I like to address the elephants in the room. And unfortunately, sometimes the people that are the evangelists for using games in the classroom, sometimes unknowingly perpetuate some of these, these beliefs that games are not a true or good teaching tool. And I'm gonna talk about that. So my journey using games. So the first couple of slides here, I'm gonna talk about the evolution of John Dillon as a presenter and using games. So my background is public safety. Um, and one of the toughest groups I've taught in my career has been law enforcement. I spent 20 years in Dakota County, which is in Minnesota. And I did 80% of the Dakota County uh, law enforcement agencies training. And this was not very fun training for them to go through. They dreaded it. Um, when they came in, and I'll tell you how tough a group this was. If I got done with training and nobody complained, that was good training. If somebody came up to me afterwards and said, you know, that wasn't bad. That's like a standing ovation. I felt I, felt I had a lot in common with a kindergarten teacher. I constantly had to engage this group to, to teach them. And I'm sure you have audiences like that as well. We all have those groups. And, and by the way, law enforcement really helped me cut my teeth as a presenter because once I was able to do a very effective, a good job with them, boy, when I went into the college and taught and I went into the industry and taught, those skills I learned, boy, people weren't used to instructors being engaging. So it's just something that was a skill. And I really do embrace that, that, that background I got from them. It's very tough. And I'm going to talk about some of those experiences here. So I'm going to use a question here. And I do often, a lot of times in my, when I'm using games to teach, use what appears to be random trivia. But even trivia, every point that I bring into my presentation has a teaching point to it. And I'm going to draw a lot of correlation to how I use a game and how I use PowerPoint. They're very similar. So back in 1964, Jeopardy debuted. I think all of us have heard of the television Jeopardy. There's been many iterations of Jeopardy style games using the class, uh, the classroom. And I really, nowadays we call this gamification. You know, when I started using games, gamification wasn't even a word. So the thing with it is though, is Jeopardy really was the foundation. I remember probably in the, the seventies when I was in high school, a teacher using a Jeopardy style game on the board with sheets of paper or different variations. And I probably saw at least 20, you know, before I actually started using at least 20 or 30 different iterations of, uh, of a Jeopardy style game in a classroom. I even saw it being done in Photoshop at Photoshop user world. There is such a conference by the way. So anyway, I have a question for you. How many questions are asked in an episode of Jeopardy? Again, it seems to be a random um, trivia question, but I'm not asking trivia just to ask for trivia's sake. I'm trying to make a point here. Just pick the best answer you think is correct. All right, 46% of the audience says 51. You know, I would have thought the same thing. The answer actually is 61. And the relevance of this is this. I want you to think about this for a second. That's 61 questions in 18.8 minutes of airtime. That's a lot of questions. And you remember, 
the only thing they talk about after the question is if you got it wrong, they'll give the correct answer and they move on. The point of this question was very simple. You have to really know your objective. The producers of Jeopardy and whoever puts it on, their whole goal is to sell ad revenue. And the more ratings they have, the more they can charge for the, the, uh, the commercials. Our goal is to educate. And we really need to make that distinction. And even when we educate, sometimes we're just, we want to review for a test. We want to review content we just taught. Or maybe we do want to teach a subject using a game format. You need to know your objective. And you need to ask yourself when you get done, did you achieve that objective? If my objective is to simply have fun, and I've done content-based entertainment games at conferences where I've been asked, hey, let's do a Jeopardy style game and we'll do content, but we're not going to spend the time talking on it. We're going to just say, here's the question. Did you get it right or wrong and move on? If I'm going to do this as an educational tool, I'm going to slow it down. And to give a comparison, they're doing 61 questions in 18 minutes. I may actually just do 25 questions in an hour because I'm going beyond the question and the answers. So you really need to define what is your objective. We have people coming in sometimes, and I remember this in the early days. Hey, we want to make it like a Jeopardy game and uh, have the answer in the form of a question. I think that kind of doesn't, the more you try to try to emulate a television show here, I think the more you're more likely are not going to achieve your goal. And I'll use some examples here. I'm sure all of us have heard this from you know, maybe managers or different people. When I was teaching at the University of Minnesota, paramedics had many different jobs. I only worked 10 days a month as a paramedic. So I did lots of teaching and I worked at the University of Minnesota in their uh, nursing department. And I was teaching CPR to nurses and they was not a fun class for them. And I went in and I remember sitting down with my uh, nurse manager and she asked, how's it going? And I said, oh my gosh, it's going really well. Uh, the the employees, the nurses are really enjoying the class. They're having a lot of fun. And she stopped me right there like I just said a bad word. And to her, the bad word was fun because they are not here. She said these exact words to me. And I remember thinking at the time she was, oh, what a, what old fashioned. But you know, the point is I looked at it. She was absolutely right. My goal was not to have, have them have fun. My goal was to teach them a skill. Fortunately, I brought in the evaluations and I was able to show that people felt really comfortable in the class. They felt more at ease during the class and they felt that they learned better in this class environment. And so the point of this is my focus is not having fun. My focus is to teach whatever my objective is, but I'm using fun to achieve that goal. Gamification, engagement, there's different terminology for it. So in the beginning, and this is the actual CD case of the first uh, iteration of my quiz show. You know, it's like showing your high school picture, you know, 40 years later. It kind of looks ridiculous. But, you know, that's the way it was. Uh, and this was designed originally for um, public safety. And it was really kind of a niche market I was working on because I was doing a lot of conferences and speaking with national conferences. So I was working for the city that I retired with here uh, recently. And I was asked to do a uh, aware training infectious disease. Let me put it this way. It was really bad training in the past. So in our alpha version of the software where I had to program it in the background, I put in my questions and my answers. We didn't have summary slides or preview slides. It would keep score. It would be a timer to it. And it'd be more of a, a polished look to it. And so I did it. So I had 45 people in my first session. I was going to do four sessions. The first session did, it was an absolute hit. Everybody just loved it. I mean, I, oh my gosh, talk about an ego stroke. I mean, people just was, has so much fun. I had support staff in there, had never gone through this information and they loved it. Everybody was regretting the training, by the way, the standard, their expectations are really low. So that helps, but it was a hitch. But the next day I said, you know, I want to find out, did I achieve my goal? And it didn't take me long to find out. Nope. I totally failed. Yes. They had fun. And the, in the pitfall here that instructors fall into is they gauge the success of their training because the students enjoyed it. Hey, look, when I taught at a college, if I let them out early two hours, they loved it, but that doesn't make it a good teaching tool. So 
the point is you got to know what your objective is. So the next, the next two weeks later, we're doing another situation. We added summary slides. I decided I'm going to slow it down. I'm going to add more content. And over the next 20 or 30 or 40 different plays of it, we started making changes to software. And I started to change my style. So the one thing I hear from educators all the time, my game contains educational material, so therefore it's educational. Well, that's like saying my PowerPoint contains lots of facts and figures and charts, so therefore it's educational. We all have sat through presentations and they've been full of this stuff and you didn't get a thing out of it. So again, content does not equal education. Um, my aha moment simply was this. I'm just going to paraphrase it. The more I tried to play, we used ringing devices before, you know, who rung in first. I forgot them one day for a training class of police officers. I thought the class was going to be like root beer float without the root beer. I ended up doing round robin. And long story short, it ended up being the best session I ever did. And from that point on, if I was using a game to teach, I never used the ringing devices again. Now, I'm not talking about audience response pads where people like your guy is doing here. I'm talking about those things you're in. I found the more I tried to emulate the television show, the, the, I had to bring the group down. It was more work. But when I got done with this training afterwards, I had a training sergeant come up to me and says, you tricked us. You came in with broccoli, doing a subject everybody hates. You not only made it fun, we actually learned during it. And that was the power of engagement, but I brought it down. And it's it just, th these things were just distractions. So the point I'm going to go, and I'm going to show some examples here. Games and PowerPoint to me are the same thing. I took my infectious disease talk that I, you know, created back in 1991 with the 10, 10, 30, 19, 10 rule. Um, uh, and I actually literally took the teaching points, put it in a game format, and then I switched to a game. And it's just, it's the same way. The difference is, is I'm using, you know, content, before and after the questions and the questions and the answers are bullet points. And I'm going to show you some examples. Audience response pads, like you see here, or the smart devices or the Trinity Tech keypads in the early days or eye clickers were a game changer because not only can you create teams, but you can also track individual results and use that response to add additional teaching points. So let's go ahead and show you some examples. This is a slide directly from my infectious disease talk. That was PowerPoint. The graphics have improved over the years, but this is the essence of what I did when I lectured. Uh, basically, I just wanted the people to know it was a bacterial disease. How do you got the disease? Basically, it's through droplets and cough that's in the air. And so I'm going to ask a question. Now, because this is a question people ask me, well, I can see how to review, but how do you teach? Again, I'm going to teach you something, and I'm really keeping this brief for time's sake. And then I'll ask them to answer a question. And I know this for a lot of you aren't in healthcare. It didn't make any difference. I was teaching people who were in healthcare. But when transporting a symptomatic TB patient, what can you do to minimize your exposure besides wearing a mask? And I'd ask my audience to answer this. And I'm going to give you like five seconds to quickly pick an answer. Okay, I'm just going to go ahead and advance. Sorry for the time factor, but I just want to get through some of these questions. Now, 22% of you said open vents and windows. Now, here's the point I want to make. Each of these answers are bullet points. Now, when I was teaching, now, you guys are smart. You know, place sheets over the patient's head is not an answer, a correct answer. But trust me, in public safety, people will pick it. Knowing that, I would use that as a teaching point. What? Okay, putting a sheet over somebody's head is probably going to get you in the six o'clock news. But what else can we do to achieve the same goal? And we'd have a discussion. Spraying the area with disinfectant. Um, you know, our goal is to disperse the air. Anyway, so on and so forth. So all of the above is not correct. So anyway, you get the idea. And then I would have a summary slide that would go into deeper uh, teaching points here. And I did a lot of scenarios, and I'm going to just show you another example here. Um, this is when I did my diabetic lecture, I had a PowerPoint, and I literally took what I did in my lecture and put it into the game. In fact, I asked this question verbally in my class. Well, now I can do it, and with audience response pads, I can get immediate feedback. In wrong answers, 
I deliberately wrote this question for wrong answers. And again, for time's sake, I'm going to go ahead and move forward here. Okay, so the majority of you said high blood sugar. I got some saying low blood sugar and obesity. So what I would quickly do in the classroom, actually we'll talk about a little late, later. Obesity is a contributing factor. It's not a cause, of, it's not a result of diabetes. Low blood sugar, I get it. When you hear about diabetic emergencies, most diabetic emergencies are about low blood sugar, not about high blood sugar. So, uh, but really diabetes is a disease. It's all about managing your blood sugar keeping it in the normal range. So I come back to my scenario, diabetic, and I had like four or five questions, but I'm just giving you kind of the Reader's Digest version here. Uh, I would go through a, this 56-year-old female, says her blood sugar is low, sitting, drinking orange juice, eating a powdered donut. She's at work. It's 10 o'clock in the morning. She has a history of diabetes in the family. So it's heredity. She has some heredity, you know, issue she says and not taking any medications so here's my question and again i would ask this in fact these answers came from my verbal interactions in a classroom with powerpoint and i just simply made a question with it so what do you think my red flag was so my both my partner and i immediately knew she you know her blood sugar wasn't low now of course we confirmed that with the blood glucose test but we immediately even before he checked the blue blood blood uh, blood sugar levels knew her blood sugar wasn't low not based on the story she was telling us. Okay, I'm going to go ahead again, time-wise, just go ahead and move forward. And as suspected, I get answers across the board in the top three. Uh, the fact of the matter is, the answer is B. The fact is she's not taking any of her medications. The fact is, if she did develop diabetes, which she could, and it is hereditary, her blood sugar would actually be high, not low. Now, there are medical conditions that can cause low blood sugar, but there's something we don't really encounter, but it's the medications they take. All right, I'm going to just show uh, one more example here, and then um, I'm going to leave it open to questions and answers. 30 minutes goes very quickly here. So here's a question I did in Anaheim for a conference because, you know, it's Disney out there. Goofy was originally named Dippy Dog. Go ahead and pick an answer. This is true or false? This is some random, but I just want to show you some ideas you can do with true false. For me, I want to know what the audience truly knows. And I'm going to use that information as teaching points. All right, just go ahead and show the results. And as expected, I get answers kind of across the board, which really doesn't tell me anything as an instructor. So I'm going to rephrase the answers. And I just want to show you how I do this. And again, uh, for time's sake, I'm probably not going to give a lot of time to go through this, but I just, we still got true false, but with high confidence and low confidence. And I would simply ask my audience, pick what's best. By the way, you can change your answer anytime until I close out this session. All right. And for time's sake, I'm going to go ahead and end this. How am I doing on time? Just a few minutes left. So, we're seeing a lot of true and false. So it kind of tells me, yeah, people aren't really sure of their answers, but at least they get a better idea. So I like to use trivia, especially if I'm doing a repeat class. So sometimes I'm doing the same group two years and you know, I come back every year. I would go in every year and tweak my questions and find a different question to cover that same content in a different way. Uh, this is one that I did. It seems to be trivial, but there's a point to this. Mary Malone became infamous for the spread of what disease? Now, again, I'm going beyond the question and the answers. I'm adding preview slides. I'm adding summary slides. I'm stopping and talking about it. And just like it would if I was doing a PowerPoint presentation. All right. Well, look at this. Everybody got the answer right. Perfect. But the, the whole point of this question is I want to talk about hepatitis A. And typhoid and hepatitis A have a lot in common. Typhoid is not very common in the U.S. It is in third world countries. It's still very prevalent. Uh, it has both are shed through the GI system. Both uh, are spread by contaminated food, water, um, similar symptoms. The big thing I wanted to teach here, Mary became infamous because she absolutely refused to believe she was infecting people. She was asymptomatic. And I talk about 
you know, the ASIM, you can't always rely on people knowing they're sick. HIV, COVID goes on and on. They may not even know they're a carrier. So you have to assume everybody's a carrier and, you know, when you're in healthcare and, and you know, you, you actually have to have a little bit of a paranoia. I'm going to go ahead and kind of just get to the, skip to the final question before I run out of time. So we went through a lot of information here. Aaron has sent out um, the, the, the notes and we'll send it out again, you know, so there's links there. And if you want to learn more, for those that, that attended the webinar, you notice that I abruptly got shut down at the very end of my closing. So I'm just going to, that's why we're calling this the Unplugged Edition. Get it? Uh, all we really talked about afterwards is just some resources. And what you can do is you can go down, check the notes below in the YouTube notes. And we have links there. You can also scan the QR code here if you want to find out more about the Bravo Zone. Um, and of course, you can email us at support at c3softworks.com. I want to thank you for attending the session. I apologize. Uh, I just had a power surge and it just kicked me off. Um, fortunately, it was at the very end of the presentation. Um, I was just going to take questions, but please feel free to reach out with questions to support at c3softworks.com and we will get back to you in the same day. With that, as I like to say, hope you always find unique ways to make your next training more engaging. Take care.